Cliff, welcome back to our interview uh, on the Valida YouTube channel. Now we're having another person who has questions. Welcome, Moritz. Thank you, my pleasure. It's nice to have you here. In the last uh, episode, we talked about how you get a feeling about a company, the company culture, you go there, get a certain idea, impression, a gut feeling, you feel the atmosphere. What other factors do you use or how do you evaluate the company's culture? Well, you know, I should be clear that evaluating these things, the culture is, I am definitely a price and business model first type of investor. These are areas that have become increasingly important to me and that I think I've developed in, but they're not kind of the first thing. So I don't have, I would not consider myself as particularly good at making these evaluations. Um, but in general, you know, I talk to a lot of former, a lot of my work involves talking to former employees. Um, and um, frankly, you know, you can get a sense just from talking to former employees. If someone was an employee who was an employee for a reasonable period of time, who left on good, in good terms, you're kind of getting a chance to understand what the actual people there are actually like. Uh, obviously, if they were fired or weren't there very long, you know, you're, not, you're getting a sample of rejects. So if you can limit yourself to the sample of proper employees who you know, could still be there if they wanted to be, you can just learn a lot by, you know, if they provide, if they ask them the projects they worked on, ask them why they worked on those projects, ask them how they value those projects, ask them what decisions were made and why they were made, and you start to understand how the organization works in a nuts and bolts way. And if it's a way that makes sense, that seems to be leading to appropriate outcomes, that you're impressed by the people that you're dealing with and you think that they're making good decisions um, and you would want to work for those people and um, you just generally find that like you're, you're dealing with good people, then you know they're probably indicative of the organization. Um, and you can always ask, like, you know, what's it like to work there? <laughs> um, but in, in general, I, I, I've become increasingly, you know, if on the other hand, you talk to people who were there for eight years and seemed to have an important role and got promoted a couple times and then eventually went left on good terms and they're not very bright and you ask them questions and they give you answers where you're like, but did you think about this? And they're like, no, we didn't think about that. You know, then that's, you know, probably a problem, right? They've probably selected a lot of mediocrity. Um, you know, if the guy says, oh, I had this great idea, you know, but like it never worked, you say, why didn't it work? And they say, well, you know, like we just never, like Bob never liked it. Or, you know, but, you know, those are bad signs, right? So that's what you're looking for. And you know, would you like to work there? Would you like to work with this person? How many, uh, how do you get your context for these interviews? Oh, I, you know, I make a lot of use of expert networks. Um, you know, you basically pay them and they do the legwork for you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's lazy man the way of doing it. So you don't conduct, you conduct the interviews by yourself? Yeah. And how many do you do usually? <laughs> we, we do a couple hundred a year, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, across a variety of businesses that we're looking at at one degree of, you know, sophistication. Look, you know, there is a bit of um, a, uh, I think, a misconception uh, and I think I think Buffett's, you know, created it a little bit of value investors sitting around and reading 10Ks all day. You can't bring information to markets by reading 10Ks. This is not to say that you don't read the 10K, but that is, you know, like like reading the 10K or whatever is table stakes for understanding a company. If you want to develop an understanding of a company that is differentiated from the market, you need to actually gather information, you know, from the field. Um, and so I would say that, you know, talking to people who worked at, competed with, are customers of um, the companies that you're studying is definitely the, the, by far the best way to, that I've found, to get uh, a sense of, you know, how things actually work, you know, on the ground. Interesting. Um, in your letters you said you're looking somehow to find the driving forces or the, the clear core and you don't want to get disturbed by too much information. How do you do this or what's your filters? Well, I wouldn't say it's too much information. I, I would say that if you look at an investment, what, if you're making long-term investments, you're, you're 10 year investments that are in theory going to be sold to someone who's also thinking into the future, you're thinking pretty far out there. and. So a good investment, I mean, it's really not complicated, right? Like you want a compelling value proposition to consumers. 
you want real reasons why other people won't be able to duplicate this or erode your economics via competition. And that's it, right? I mean, you know, and you care about market size or whatever, the price you pay. But, but those are the things that you're thinking about. And so it's, it's not that there's too much information. The point is that to think about, take the information you get and sort of ask yourself, we're sitting here 10 years from now. Was this quarter's sale, week sales due to weather? Are we going to look back on that as like the seminal moment where, you know, this company, where that was it, like, you know, it all fell apart? And you know, the answer is sort of when you frame it that way for a lot of things is, is like, no, like obviously 10 years from now, no one's going to remember this. Um, you know, but on the other hand, you know, sometimes they will. And, and so that is a great filter. You know, just ask yourself, it's 10 years from now, are we talking about this? Or, you know, and the answer is no. You know, don't worry about it very much. Um, but on the other hand, you know, think about the things that will matter in ten years. Uh, you know, um, and and then take those seriously. Um, and and I had a friend who was at a particularly important moment in his career. And we've had this discussion a few times, and he had a, a few very important decisions to make. And I said, you know, I won't use his name. But, you know, I said, uh, listen, you know, how we talk over time about how like they're think about things from ten years from now, and don't work, don't sweat the stuff that won't matter in ten years. Well, this is one of those moments where. It's gonna matter in ten years. You better think. <laughs> so. <laughs> and what are the factors that matter in ten years? Oh, well, you know, I talked about. It. I mean, what you care no, no, about. The, not the example of your friend, but in general. Yeah. No. I mean, look. You, you want a compelling value proposition that um, that will still be relevant and compelling, you know, in, in the distant future. Uh, and you want you know, barriers to competition that are real and enduring. Um, you know, and, and that's it. And, and so any anything that, you know, would make you worry that, that, the, that the value proposition will either not be good or will be undermined uh, by some other, you know, something else, or anything that would make you worry that the barriers to competition will erode away, um, you know, those are, those are serious problems. And, but, um, uh, but, you know, other things are sort of not issues. Well, I would like to know uh where you get your information. I mean, um, of course, reading 10K is, uh, is, is one way, but um, uh, which newspaper, for example, do you read? Which magazines, uh, which uh, internet websites do you use? Uh, can you give us a, an idea of, of uh, yeah. how you generate those ideas? So, um, well, I mean, I don't know. I, I get exposed to a certain amount of information, you know, through all the usual channels. I, I, I read the Wall Street Journal uh, most days, um, you know, Uh, but I wouldn't say there's anything special about that. But the, the real information gathering that we do, I would say, takes the form of hypothesis testing. So if, you know, what I would say is when you're stud studying an investment, the, the analogy is like that of the sciences. So you look at a situation, you develop a hypothesis. That hypothesis then makes predictions about what, what should be true in the world. Your diligence then comes down into validating or invalidating those predictions. The information that will validate or invalidate those predictions can vary incredibly wide, you know, widely. Um, and you know, the if you think about it, we, we if you think about theoretical physicists, right? There's like theorists, and then there's you know, exp practitioners, experimenters. In, in investing, we play both, right? So you you start as a theorist, and you ask maybe this is what's happening, and then. And then you put your you know your experimenter's hat on and, and try to go figure out whether or not it's true. Um, the experiments people run in physics are totally uninformative unless you have the theory. Um, so if, you know, I'm reminded of um, when um, I forget the name of the guy, but Einstein had the prediction about, about general relativity, you know, in the light of the sun bending around um, at the time at the solar eclipse. And you know, a bunch of people right after World War One, they sort of went around the world and they got measurements of the of the sunlight during the solar eclipse, and and they found that it bent. Um, as predicted by Einstein and not as predicted by Newton, and that was a very big validating fact for general relativity. Um, you know, that experiment is totally silly, absent the theory, the two conf conflicting theories. So, so the work that we try to do in terms of gathering data or evidence is really around, oftentimes around that specific hypothesis testing. Um, now, what's also true is that, you know, as you observe the world, you, it feeds back into your theories, right? So you get new questions from new things you learn. So that's not to say that there isn't a certain amount of just general observation 
because you just you know if you get too focused on what you think is true, then obviously you could miss the really relevant thing around you. Um, so there's a certain amount of just like browsing the landscape. But in general, when you think of where the work really gets done, it, it's it's digging deep. And so I'll give you another example. We invested in a company um, called LifeLock, and LifeLock sold still sells uh, a product that protects people against identity theft. And at the time we invested, there were essentially two competing theories about LifeLock. One theory was that um, was by people who were bears, I guess. And, and it was that the product didn't do any good, that it um, was only sold because people were deceived, and that the people who owned it and subscribed to it, you, you know, that they were basically victims of deception and wouldn't ever own it if they um, knew what it really did and didn't do. Um, and the, the other argument was that actually, no, it, it, it's a product that does good, that it's a branded product that people are basically paying a premium for, and that's why people are, are happy to have it, and it's basically a brand. Um, and a particular type of brand that I spent a bit of time exploring. And your view on the investment you know, basically came down to that. And so, you know, this actually leads to some testable, you can do some work, you can actually test this. And so, you know, what do you do? Well, first we did a bunch of work. For example, we found there's this question of the frequency of identity theft. So it turns out there were national statistics on the frequency of identity theft. And so that's great, but then, but then you're like, okay, but does LifeLock work? And there's no obvious way to measure that. Except what we did was we, f we found people who used to work in the call centers. And we asked them, how many people worked in the call centers? And how many calls per day did you have? And what portion were identity theft? And it turns out that there was a dedicated team that dealt with the people. And we were actually able to get a reasonable estimate of the, of the frequency of identity theft amongst LifeLock users. And I forget the exact number, but we found a meaningful reduction. So the product works. Um, and, the next, and there's other reasons why, you, why it would be beneficial, even if it didn't have a meaningful reduction. So that was true, it definitely had benefit. Um, the next thing was this idea that people were only buying it because they were deceived. Well, I mean, the company sells it every month, every quarter, so we can just go look at the ads. And so you get an understanding of the law, you get an understanding of the product, then you go look at the ads. <laughs> is this, does, does this fairly represent the product? I mean, advertising is promotional, but like within the bounds of advertising, is this, is this, is this reasonable? And you know, my, our perception is, yeah, definitely. Okay, so current buyers are clearly not deceived. But that didn't get to the install base. Maybe all the people who have it are deceived. And so you know, this actually led to an experiment. So we, what we did was we, did, we were able to identify a group of LifeLock users with a third-party survey provider. And we identify, and, and we, we presented them with a survey where we asked them you know, questions about LifeLock. You know, how'd you get it? And like, you know, have you ever suffered identity theft? Or do you know someone? A whole bunch of questions. But the important, and there was inter we were interested in the answers, but not that interested. The important thing was that half of the survey respondents, in the middle of the survey, they were presented with a slide, which said, here's what LifeLock does, and here's what it doesn't do. And it was to the best of our understanding, but it probably was designed to more narrowly define what LifeLock does. You know, so so if, if, if someone was doubting it, it would be negative to LifeLock, you know, understated LifeLock's ability. And at the end of the survey, we then asked all of the survey participants, would you, do you plan to renew? And what we and, and the question we were trying to get to was, um, you know, if you could inform people about what LifeLock does or doesn't do, would they renew? And um, what we found was that there was a, that, that what we told people did statistically significantly reduce the renewal rate, but it it went from like ninety three to like seventy five or something like that. So it was clear that while there was you know some portion of people who once you spent more time explaining what it doesn't what does and doesn't do wouldn't want to have it. The vast majority were perfectly happy with it, even once you'd taken the time to explain to them, you know, exactly what it does. And so, um, you know, now I think it's. I think once you've sort of gathered that evidence, it becomes really hard to believe the hypothesis that this thing is a big fraud and deception and all the rest. It makes it much easier to buy it on the stock, right? And you've gotten to the the core of the matter. Your um, investment style um, has probably changed over time or in the past years. I mean, you mentioned earlier in the first video that. Um, the role of the management has become more important for you today. Um, is there any, any other thing that has changed um, in the past years? Oh, yeah. Um, look, if you, you know, we operate in a, social science is not physics. So the models that we use to describe how society works are really crummy by comparison. They're really, basically glorified heuristics. And as a consequence, 
Um, a lot of those models are very incomplete or wrong, but they're right enough in a certain time and place that they make reliable enough predictions that you can use them to a point. And <coughs> one really important way that I think many investors ultimately fall by the wayside is that they fail to consistently update their models of the world and to throw out the models that have become dated. And so if I just think about how I've, you know, when I, you know, when I was an earlier, younger investor, I, I certainly wouldn't have thought about investing in a company like a Carvana, um, which loses gobs of money and is fairly young. And, and, you know, there's a whole lot of reasons that I just wasn't mentally equipped to do that. And, and so over the years, you know, I've been sort of adding ways of thinking about the world, which I think have somewhat broadened what I can do. Um, I've also thrown out biases that I think were, you know, people had, a, I think, an appropriate bias against technology companies when the companies were purveyors of technology per se, because they'd correctly observed that the tech, if you, if you are selling, um, I don't know, some new whiz-bang way to organize uh, something with semiconductor chips, and then the way semiconductor chips is made is both rapidly change is rapidly changing, and there's lots of competing technologies. The half life of your technology being particularly relevant can be very short, and and so it's very difficult to invest in a technology where the reason if, in a business where the reason you're advantaged is dependent on a bunch of things that are moving very fast and thus unlikely to endure. So I think people correctly figured that out, but they then incorrectly applied that heuristic to many businesses, including businesses that you know use technology, uh, the technology of the day, to basically build a normal business. And, and I, I, I sort of remind people that you know, 140 years ago, making you know toasted uh, flakes and transporting them by rail was high tech stuff. Um, and you know, we, very few people would look at General Mills and think like technology company, but it was. And so there is an opportunity, I think, to better understand companies that use technology to build businesses that are enduring for reasons not related to technology. And I've spent a lot of time sort of broadening my set of understandings there. Um, you know, so I'd say that's you know one big area that I've evolved in. Um, and that's many little, you know, there's many little evolutions that come to something like that. And if you have found such a company, are you willing to pay uh, higher multiples for the company for, the, for good quality? Or are you still looking for a cheaper price? Because many investors are, if they have you know, a great quality business, they pay higher multiples. How do you handle that situation? Yeah, I, I, I don't think about it like that at all. Um, just the framework, I don't use that framework. Um, I think about what the company is going to be in five or ten years and um, how confident I am in that and the range of outcomes that are reasonable um, and how confident I am in that range, right? So think about it this way. There's, there's a range of outcomes that's assuming I've diagnosed this company properly. There's a range of outcomes. But there's some chance that I have not diagnosed this company properly. That's harder to think about, but you have to fact, but like if you're making a bet on it depends on the mental models you're using, how much confidence you're going to put in that range. And then, once you, if you have equally, if you have ranges that you're equally confident in, you kind of are just sort of comparing the means. Um, although you do care a little about the distribution and correlation, but you, know, you care about basically about the means, and you want to buy the one that's going to do better. Um, and so, you know, a high quality business such as you describe, what that would have to mean to me to be a high quality business is that in five or ten years it's going to be bigger or more profitable by a larger quantum per share you know for owners than a low quality business and so that comparison basically evaporates if you if you just say like you know five or ten years from now what what is this worth um, it no longer becomes relevant um, to sort of say high quality or low quality um, I don't know if that does that does that make sense yeah yeah uh, and maybe one more question uh, sure uh, how does a typical day in your life look like here, uh, or a typical week? I mean, are you traveling a lot, or 
um, reading as I said 10 Ks all day or what does it usually look like? Yeah, I um, my, my days vary a great deal, uh, but in general, um, I don't travel a ton. I actually don't spend nearly as much time, I think, uh, as other people do meeting with companies in person. And my comment about having a vibe when you walk into the place is true, but it's also not uh, something I do that much of. Um, for the most part, I spend my days um, either on the phone doing these calls with experts, or I often are reading uh, or listening to um, companies' earnings calls, where like a great way to learn about a business is to start with maybe the 10K and the investor presentation, and then pull up you know the last two or three investor presentations and the last four conference calls, and I queue them up on my you know um, on my phone, and I put my headsets on, and I go for a four mile walk, and I listen at double speed, and I come back, and I've lived through like you know a year in the life of the company. And then you say to yourself, you know, was that interesting? Like, what do I think? Do I have a theory here? And then maybe you can then say, you know, maybe I'll do some calls. And then you, you set up a few calls with sort of, you know, people who maybe work there or whatever and ask a few more questions and then decide if you want to keep working and what your hypothesis might be and so forth. So I would say that, you know, the productive time is spent, you know, doing that. I also, I, you know, spend a fair bit of time um, studying, you know, gen generally. Um, you know, the, you know I, I think... People overemphasize how much time investors need to spend um, studying com companies one by one. Um, you know, I think that um, if you think about investing as the serendipitous outcome, good investments are like a serendipitous outcome where a prepared mind, you know, meets an opportunity. And so, people who just study opportunities after one after the other are neglecting preparing their minds. And so, I spend a fair bit of time also just preparing my mind, which fortunately all of this is fun for me, so it doesn't really work. But like that means reading books, it means listening to podcasts, you know. So you'll you'll find me driving uh, out of my house to go get coffee, you know, uh, and then walking around drinking my coffee, listening to like a book on you know, a book on Audible. And you know, for most people they'd sort of say, and you and are you working? And they say, Well yeah, I don't I look homeless, but I'm not actually, you know, homeless. Um, and so um, you know, that's, uh, I, I do a fair bit of that. And also, you know, like, it's super important, you know, in investing in life in general, but you have to take care of yourself. You have to be recognized. Just, you only have so many good hours to commit to things. And so, you know, I, I try to exercise, you know, at least sort of two out of three or three out of four days. Um, you know, I spend time with my kids. I, I spend the mornings, you know, puttering around my house until, you know, until nine o'clock, you know, and I take my kids to, to my, my daughter to school. So, you know, there's a fair bit of, of that, and it doesn't look productive, but I'm sure if I stopped doing it, um, you know, there'd be a short-term short surge in productivity followed by a substantial long-term decline. Um, the other funny thing about this job is, like, it's, it's a weird job in the sense that I've sort of joked that I've had maybe 10 productive hours in my life, right? Like, you know, the productive hour is that the, the sort of two hours that you spend or the hour that you spend learning about something new where you, you sort of start to realize that this is going to be great, right? Before that, you're preparing... After that, you're validating, but there's this like little hour in there where you sort of have the epiphany, and I don't know how to make more of those. <laughs> I'd love to; it's the best part of the job, but but like you know, the rest of the time is just it's just wasted. <laughs> mm -hmm. Does the relationship of you to a company change if you own the first stocks? Does my view change after I buy shares? Yeah, or relationship generally. Yeah. Oh, with the management team. Or like, if there's a certain different affection, or you. Do I fall in love with them over time? Some, somehow, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, uh, there's a lot of evidence that in general, once people buy some stock, they like it more. Uh, that must work on me too. Um, I try to like it before I buy it. I, I don't do like sort of starter positions and stuff like that. Um, but you know, the psychology must be at work with me. Um, my friend Rob likes to say people's biggest mistake in investing is selling too soon. So. Why not just fall in love with the companies? It's more fun and you do better. Um, and, and so I think you know he's got a good point there. Um, uh, you know, so I, I've, ever since he told me that, I've, I've allowed myself you know to, to like my companies more. Um, but um, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily you know uh, you know eventually you do sell things, and so it's important to realize that you have to wait what you have versus your opportunity cost. And it's important over time that when an investment, either you've learned disconfirming evidence that's inconsistent with your hypothesis and it's now wrong, 
um, or or just that you know it's no longer you know if you would look out five years, um, you know maybe it's going to be a double, but maybe you've got something else that could be a triple or quadruple. You'd have to be crazy, um, you know, not to to sell the one to buy the other as much as you've enjoyed getting to know the management team and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, in terms of my you know I when you own something, I definitely do you know, a fair bit of work over time, you know, following it. It's not sort of because I have to, it's because I enjoy it, but also it doesn't hurt. Um, and you do learn about a business over time and your, and your knowledge, understanding of it, you know, deepens and, um, and, and that's fun. Um, and you do sometimes, depending on the company, get to know, you know, the management team and, and, when, and if you do get to know them and that proves to be, that can prove to be a, a nice part of the, business where you kind of build a relationship over time with the people who are, you know, running the business. Um, that obviously doesn't happen every time, it depends on the company and, you know, it's not, there are people who say, oh, I'll only invest with great management teams and, you know, and uh, there are certainly benefits to investing in great, great management teams, but I, I've invested in companies with so-so management teams, but where they're great businesses at great prices and, you know, if you factor in the cost of the management team or the sort of mediocrity of the management team into the price, it can still be a great investment. Um, so, you know, maybe, I won't name names, but that relationship doesn't feel as rewarding over the years. <laughs> Thank you very much for the second part of our interview. Thank you. Thanks. We'll see you in the third as well.